Dear students and participants of the course on Railway Engineering, in this lecture, we will be continuing with the super elevation on tracks and then we will shift our discussion on the transition curves. If you remember, in the previous lecture, we started this discussion on super elevation, but it can also be termed as Kant. In that, we discussed about the various types of definitions. We talked about the equilibrium Kant. We talked about the Kant deficiency and Kant axis, the limiting values. And then we tried some of the numericals so as to find out the values of the super elevation or Kant along with the maximum permissible speeds which can be provided on any track. Continuing with the same discussion, today we will again see few of the numericals along with that we will be discussing about the negative Kent. And then after that we will shift to the transition curves wherein we will be talking about the purpose of the provision of transition curve, what are the requirements which needs to be taken care of, what are the various types of transition curves which are available and then finally, how the length of the transition curve can be calculated. So, starting with the super elevation and starting with one of the numericals in continuation of the numericals which we have seen in the previous lecture. Let us see the data. The data given here is it is a broad gauge group A route. The curve is having 1 degree curvature. Maximum sanctioned speed here is 160 kilometers per hour. If you remember in the previous numericals, we were talking about 110 kilometers per hour. So, it is a high speed track which we are talking here. The super elevation is 80 mm. We have to calculate the maximum permissible speed on this particular track. The philosophy is going to remain the same. If the degree is being given, we have to find out the radius of that curve and then we have to look at the Kent, the equilibrium Kent or the deficiencies or axis and then we calculate the safe speeds and finally, the maximum permissible speed. So, the radius on the track, the formula is 1750 divided by D where D is the degree of the curve and here it is being given as 1 percent. So, therefore, the radius of the curve becomes 1750 meters. Now, if we talk about the safe speed, which is given by a formula 0.27 and under root of Ca plus Cd into R. Here, the Ca and Cd, the Ca is being given to us which is 80 mm and Cd for a high speed track can be taken here as 100 mm. So, we have taken 180 two values here, R is already being calculated and this gives a value of 151.3 kilometers per hour as the safe speed. Now, let us move to the negative super elevation concept. On the right hand side, you can see that there is one track which is coming from the bottom and then it gets divided into two parts. That means, the train can move left or right from this track. So, this is a split. We will be discussing about the various types of splits which can be there, which can be provided when we will be talking about the track junctions. Now, here when the main track is moving in the direction towards the right, the branch line is going towards the left, there is an issue. This is the common area of curvature. The main track is going towards the right, therefore, the curvature is going in the right direction. Whereas, if you look at the branch line, the branch line is taking a curvature in the left direction. We discussed that when we are talking about a super elevation, then in that case with respect to the inner rail which can also be defined as a reference rail or the gradient rail, on the outer side we are increasing the height and that is the difference which we are talking as Kant or we are talking as the super elevation. So, going with this particular concept, it means when we are going on a main track, then this becomes the outer rail and this becomes the inner rail. That means, this section which is starting from A, so this is a point A and if we take this point which is going towards point C, 
So, this AC as compared to BD has to be on the higher side that means here this should be BD and this should be AC. But when you talk about the branch line it becomes a opposite phenomena. In this case if we consider this as A point and this here as E and at this one as F then this BF is the outer side and AE is the inner side that means this AE section will be at a lower level as compared to BF. So, in one case we are saying that section being defined here by these two lines is higher. In another case we are saying the section which is being defined by these three lines it is higher therefore, there is a problem at this level. So, this is what is being also discussed on this particular slide. What it says that when from a main line a branch line is provided using a turnout of contrary fracture, contrary fracture means in one case it is going left in another case it is going right they are not moving in the same direction. Then the super elevation required for the average speed of the trains over main line cannot be provided on the branch line. Now, rail AC on the main line shall be higher than the rail BD whereas, the rail AE shall be lower than rail BF on the branch line Well, this is what I was discussing here. This means that the main line A shall be higher than B and for the branch line B shall be higher than A. So, this is a contrary condition which is getting created which needs to be taken care of. Now, how to take care of about this? So, if we say there is a uh, super elevation which is to be provided on the main line and there is a super elevation which is to be provided on the branch line. Now, these two values needs to be in some form they needs to be adjusted. So, considering this contradictory condition which is appearing here what we do? In such conditions branch line curve is given a negative super elevation and speed on both the tracks are restricted specifically on the branch line. So, whatever the value of E m is being calculated here now it may be negative E m for the branch line. And with respect to this negative E m then if you are talking about a certain speed we will be discussing about a Kent excess or the Kent deficiencies. So, they will get added or they will be subtracted in these cases. So, calculating the negative super elevation for the branch line and reducing the speed on the main line what we do? We will first of all calculate the equilibrium super elevation for the branch line. So, speed is given to us that it, this is the speed v at which the trains will be moving say v b is the speed at which the trains will be moving on the branch line. So, they are going in this direction and for that considering here as v b g is known to us and the radius will also be known based on the curvature or a degree we can find out this equilibrium super elevation for branch line. Now, once we have got this say if I put it as a E b which I have been talking here. So, now this equilibrium this is being reduced by the Kent deficiency C d. So, whatever this E b we have calculated here we reduce it by Kent deficiency. So, E b minus C d will give you a value here. Now, this value now what happens is when we calculate this value of E this is going to be lower because of the lower speeds on the branch line. So, C d is usually 75 mm we discussed about it when we talked about the permissible values for different type of uh, elements in the design and we did also talk about that it can be taken to a maximum value of 100 mm, but usually we are working with 75 mm. So, if we consider this C d is 75, so E b minus C d. So, what happens is this value of x this comes out to be negative. So, on this side we have a negative Kent. Now, for main line what we do is this negative Kent is being converted into a positive value plus x. So, it becomes plus x for the main line. Now, once it is being made plus x now, so as to find out the speeds here what we do is we have to use the allowable Kent deficiency. 
the allowable current efficiency again can be 75 mm. So, we consider that 75 mm and then what we can do? So, we will have a value here. So, we can say it is plus C D. So, once we add this plus C D, we have got a value of a Kent for which the speed is to be calculated and we have a formula for that 0.27 under root of C A plus C D into R. So, we can find out the value. So, that is what it says super elevation mainline to calculate the maximum permissible speed. So, we have added that value here. So, E m is x plus C d and for this we calculate the speed on the main line, we calculate the safe speed on the main line and whatever is smaller of the two is being taken as the maximum permissible speed on the main line. So, I hope you have understood the procedure. So, what I am just repeating it again in the case of branch line, first of all we calculate E b for the speed given for branch line or equilibrium speed which is being given. Then we calculate the actual Kent which will be there and this is E b minus E d where it is the Kent efficiency and can be 75 mm. So, this will give you a value of negative Kent on the branch line. It is converted into a positive Kent on the main line and then to this positive value we add the Kent deficiency. So, we get a value of overall Kent here and for this we calculate V, we also calculate V s and then based on the two values which are available we will finalize what is the maximum permissible speed. So, I have just repeated the whole of the procedure again. Now, let us look at the numerical. We have a broad gauge track with 2 degree curve, branch line has 4 degree curve and the speed is 30 kilometers per hour. We have to calculate the speed on the main line track. So, here it is being given as 30 kilometers per hour and 2 degree curves. Uh, no, sorry, branch line is 4 degree curves and this uh, main one is 2 degree curve. So, here we have to calculate what is V. So, going with the procedure, the radius on the branch line R V 1750 divided by the degree. So, what we get is 437.5 meters. So, the branch line super elevation is G V square divided by 127 R where V is given as 30 kilometers per hour. So, 1750 into 30 divided by 127 into 437.5 meters which is the radius what we get is 28.34. So, we have got a value of E b here. Now, we are going to calculate the value of x. So, x we discussed this is E b minus E d. So, can deficiency is 75 mm. So, E b minus E d 28.34 minus 75 what we get is a minus 46.66 mm. So, that is a negative Kent on branch line. Now, we have to find out the speed on the main line. For that we need super elevation. So, we are transferring the values to the main line. So, whatever negative value was there it has been transferred from this minus x has been transferred here to s plus x. So, we get 46.66 mm. Again the Kent deficiency is known to us which is 75 mm as a limiting value. If we consider that, so we have C A plus C D that is 46.66 plus 75 it comes out to be 121.66. The main line radius it was a 2 degree curve. So, for a 2 degree curve the radius is 875 meters. Now, considering these values we calculate the speed and that is speed comes out to be 127 into 875 into 121.6 is divided by 1750. The formula same e is equal to G V square divided by 127 R. So, where we are calculating here the value of V. So, we get a value as 87.89 kilometers per hour by this formula and the safe speed formula is this one 0.27 and under root of C A plus C D into R. So, from there we get 88.09 kilometers per hour. So, we have got two values 1 and 2. The lower of the two is going to be the maximum permissible speed on the main line. So, the lower is 87.89. 
So this 87.89 can be considered as 88 kilometers per hour and further in the terms of uh, the multiples of 5 we usually work. So, we can also say that it can be taken as either 85 or 90 kilometers per hour. So, this is the procedure how we are going to calculate the speed and how we are going to calculate the cants, the negative cant on the branch line and the cant on the main line. Let us look at another example here. This is again a broad gauge track, curve is 3 degrees, branch line is passing through 1 in 12 turnout. So, the turnout is here, we will be discussing about the turnouts later. The maximum permissible speed on the branch line is 30 kilometers per hour, degree of curve on the branch line is 1 degrees. So, here it is 1 degree, on the other side it is 3 degrees, here the speed is 30 kilometers per hour and the turnout being provided is 1 in 12. So, where n is equals to 12 which is defined as the number of crossing. So, we have to calculate the super elevation from the branch line and the maximum permissible speed on the main line track. So, starting the same manner, first of all we calculate the radius for the branch line. So, the branch line is having 1 degree curve, so the radius comes out to be 750 only. So, super elevation for the speed being given on the branch line which is 30 kilometers per hour. So, gv square divided by 127 r is the formula. We put the values in this and what we get is this is 30 kilometers per hour and this is the value of r. So, it is 7.087 mm. Now, if you remember we discussed that whenever we calculate the cans, we just round off to a multiple of 5. Say if we do that, so we multi make it 10 mm instead of 7 mm. Now, this 10 mm value is there which is E b. Now, we are calculating x which is the actual cant which will be there on the branch line. So, it is 10 minus 75 where 75 is the cant deficiency. So, what we get is minus 65 mm. So, this is minus 65 mm on the branch line. Now, this minus 65 mm will get transferred to the main line as plus 65 mm. So, we get the super elevation on the main line as 65 m. Now, again using the concept of the Kent deficiency, so we use that we make C A plus C D where C D is 75, the value which comes out to be here is 140 m. A main line radius, the main line radius is because it is a 3 degree curve, so it comes out to be 583.3 meters. Now, considering this for 140 mm, and for uh, the radius of 583.3, we get the speed as 76.98 kilometers per hour. The safe speed can be calculated similarly and this is 0.27 CA plus CD into R under root of that. So, when we put the values here again what we are getting is 77.16 kilometers per hour, not a much difference between the two values. What we can say is that it is around 77 kilometers per hour or if you further want to round off then you can put it as 75 kilometers per hour as the value which can be used on the main line. So, this is what is also being written at the bottom. So, this is how uh, we can do the calculations for finding out the cant E B x values and then finally, the cant for the main line and the speed on the main line. Now, let us talk about the one another thing that is uh, running out super elevation. So, running out super elevation means you had a track where no super elevation is being provided because it is a straight track. But now, after that you are going to have a curved system. It means when the curvature starts completely say at this point the super elevation value E shall be provided by that. So, there is some distance within which the outer rail with reference to the reference rail or on the inner rail will keep increasing in height and that will be done at a some uniform level. So, that is what we are talking about this is a running out of the super elevation. Now, when the transition curves are provided there is no issue because transition curves are provided for this reason only. So, cant should be run up or run out on the transition curve. 
So, if suppose from this point to this point there is a transition and this is a circular curve and this is a straight section. So, our track the outer side it will start getting up with respect to the inner one and by the time it reaches here you will find that the this type of a system is already being provided. So, what we are saying that it should be run off on the transition not on the straight or on the circular curve and increasing or decreasing uniformly throughout its length. So, whatever is the length which is being taken of the transition curve on that particular length on a uniform rate it is going to be provided and that is the rate we did talk about like 1 in 360, 1 in 720 if you remember or the rate of change we discussed as 35 mm per second or 55 mm per second. In the case of known transition curves, what we do is we work with the virtual transition. Now, again if you remember this virtual transition we have discussed previously and this virtual transition where we said that there is going to be a boggy. So, a uh, boggy is being provided in this form there is no transition at this moment and this is being connected. So, half of the length is on the circular side and half of the length is on the uh, straight side with respect to the point of tangency. So, if this is a tangent point, so from that tangent point half on one side half on the other side and further if you remember correctly then this value was somewhere around 14.8 meters. So, 14.8 meters was taken as a virtual transition and half of that that is L by 2 of this here and L by 2 of this on the other side. We have discussed about it. Now, this longitudinal profile on the transition curve can be maintained in two ways. Now, these two ways have been shown here one this way and another is here. In the first one how the values are changing we can see that uh, there is a center line or there is uh, the inner uh, rail as well as the outer rail. So, what happens to those? Uh, those profiles have been shown as we move forward. So, what happens here is that uh, this is uh, one point and this is another point and in between some transition is happening. Now, these two transitions which are happening here they can happen in two different manners. The case one is the level of one of the rails is maintained and the super elevation is run out on the other rail. Usually we consider the outer rail for that and lowering it over half the transition length and raising it to the required amount of Kant over the remaining half portion of the transition. So, first of all we may be lowering it and then we may be again raising it, but then in the half of the length this is being done. The center line profile of the track in this particular case changes. So, you can see that the center line profile is going to change it is here and then it changes to this size. Whereas, in the second case what we are doing is that we are changing simultaneously the profiles of the two. So, the Kant is run out or gained over the length of the transition by raising and lowering both the rails by equal amounts symmetrically. So, when we do equal amounts symmetrically the center line profile is same one rail is going up or the other rail is going down. So, that is how we are going to achieve the total value. It means half of the super elevation is being achieved on one side and half other on the other side. So, this is the another way of working with the provision of super elevation on the track. Now, let us start our discussion on transition curves. Now, what are these transition curves? Now, transition curves are the curves which connect the straight sections with the circular curve sections. So, we have any straight section and any circular curve section. So, slowly a transition is going to connect this. So, this is what we are going to talk about. It eliminates the kinks. So, if we have provided say a straight section and from here only the curved section has been provided then these two points they will work as kink. So, as soon as this transition is provided it just means it is slowly and slowly it is changing from a radius equals to infinity on a straight section to radius is equals to r on 
curved section. Whereas here, if we have, we have provided directly the straight section with the curved section, then in that case at this point r was infinity and at this other side point the r becomes equals to r. So, it is an abrupt change. Now, when this abrupt change happens, then this kink will cause the centrifugal force to act just suddenly as soon as. Now, this centrifugal force it comes all of a sudden there will be discomfort, there will be movement of the vehicle towards the outer side. So, we talked about the various types of movements we said with respect to x axis, with respect to y axis and with respect to z axis. So, those movements were discussed, the rotations were also discussed. So, uh, that is what we are talking here. Now, it will also cause a distortion to the track alignment and will affect the stability of the rolling stock. Okay, so, this point we have discussed again and again. So, I probably need not to uh, further elaborate upon this because once this forces are acting, so the way the total base of the wheel and the axle that moves outwards or moves inwards in the forward direction or in the backward direction with the uh, outer rail or with the inner rail, those type of uh, discussions you can also again make here. It will also cause discomfort to the passengers, obviously, because uh, uh, everything is happening suddenly, there is no transition, there is no uniform application of the provision of uh, different uh, elements here in terms of super elevation, in terms of uh, uh, the provision of uh, centrifugal force. So, that discomfort is uh, going to be happen. Provision of a transition between circular curve and a straight section, it allows gradual and uniform introduction of the centrifugal force and makes the movement of the train is smooth. So, we get the positive side as soon as we have provided the transition curve. So, on the basis of this discussion, we can make out what are the purposes for which the transition curves are provided. Very first thing is reduction in the radius of the curvature at a uniform rate. We did talk about that it is infinite at the straight section and becomes equals to a finite value say r on the curved section. So, there is a change over. So, this reduction is to be done at a uniform rate, it should not happen abruptly. A smooth traversing of the vehicle through gradual introduction of the centrifugal force. So, as we are changing the radius from infinity to r, so the centrifugal force is increasing slowly and slowly and slowly. So, that provision when it comes, then it is not going to create a problem to the passengers because the passengers may not be even able to identify that some type of that aspect is happening unless it is a sharp curve. Introduction of super elevation at a constant rate from 0 to a constant value which we have calculated say as cant e. So, we have to bring it to that particular value. So, what are the requirements so that we can provide a smooth introduction of super elevation, a smooth introduction of centrifugal force and there is a complete comfort for the passengers. First of all, it should be tangential to the straight line of the track. So, when it is starts from the straight line, it should be tangential. So, this becomes a tangent for the transition curve. So, obviously, when it is tangential at this point, the radius is not there. So, it is a basically a zero condition. It should join this circular curve also tangentially. So, wherever the circular curve is provided, so if uh, suppose the circular curve is here, so at this point also it should work tangentially. So, at this point there the radius was 0, here the radius is going to be r. Its curvature should increase in th at the same rate as the super elevation. That means the two things are being correlated now, the curvature as well as super elevation and the rate of change of both of the things shall be same. The length of the transition curve should be adequate to attain the final super elevation which increases at a uniform rate. So, because we have said that it is going to be say 1 in x, this is the rate at which the super elevation is to be provided and you have to provide a super elevation equals to C A. So, 
whatever length is required that length is to be understood. So, here we said that it is for a value of x uh, say in uh, distance of x we are going to provide a value of 1. So, now if we have to provide C A it means it is C A into x that is what is the distance which will be required. So, this distance should be available and because this whole of the thing is happening on the transition curve and if you have provided the complete length then there is no issue and the whatever speeds are there, there will be only two criteria which will you will be talking further on the basis of the Kent and on the basis of the, uh, uh, the maximum speed or safe speeds. The third criteria which usually comes when you are not being able to provide the length of the transition curve as required then we have to go for that criteria. And we discussed about this aspect previously also. Now, let us have a look at uh, the various types of the transition curves. One is the Ehlers spiral curve, the equation of this Ehlers spiral curve is phi is equals to L square divided by 2 RL, where phi is the angle between the straight track and the tangent to the transition curve. We said the transition curve should be tangential to the straight track. So, at that point whatever is angle is there. So, we are just going, so this one is the angle phi. L is the distance of any point on the transition curve from the takeoff point. So, it is a start taking off from this point. So, we are considering the distance here. So, this is L. This is ideal but not preferred due to mathematical computations. So, there is an issue with the computational level and because of that issue this is not being considered. So, if you look at on the right hand side one uh, figure is being given where different type of transition curves which are possible are being shown. Say if you look at this is a Bernoulli's lamniscate, so it is in this circular form. Then there is a spiral, so this one is the spiral case. Then there is a sine curve, which is like this, and there is a cubic parabola, which is going here. Now in all of these cases, if we talk about this measure axis, which is a 45 degree from both of the x axis and y axis, uh, we can see that the tangential conditions are there. So, there is angles which are going to be provided for this tangent condition as being shown here. And at the same time, uh, in the case of say the Bernoulli's lamniscate, for at any point here, if we talk, so the tangent is being created, so it will give a value of phi. The another one is the cubic spiral as we talked there. So, it is defined by L square divided by 6 RL. This is also a one of the ideal curves so as to use for transition, but again the problems are with respect to the setting of these type of curves in the field. Bernoulli's lamniscate, here the radius decreases as the length increases and this causes the radial acceleration to keep on falling. But what is being observed that beyond the deflection angle of 30 degrees, the uniformity is lost. The same thing which we are talking here that how it is increasing or decreasing, the two things are happening as the length is increasing, radius is decreasing. So, that is the reason that it is not being used on the Indian railways. Cubic parabola, this is y is equals to x cube over 6 RL, it is mainly used on Indian railways. Here the curvature as well as the Kent they increases at a linear rate. So, a uniform rate is there at which this keeps increasing along the length of the curve. The inner rail that remains at the same level and outer rail is raised in the linear form throughout the length of the curve. So, the inner rail we already said it is a reference rail or it is a gradient rail with respect to which the rest of the changes will be there. The straight line ramp is provided on each transition curve. One more can be there as a S shaped transition curve. So, in this case the curvature and super elevation they assumes the shape of two quadrant parabola. The shift from the circular curve is half of that which is required usually in the normal condition. In the normal condition we see that shift S is equals to the length of the transition curve is square of that divided by 24 R. So, it is half of this that means it is L square divided by 48 R. And the gradient is at the center 
and is twice steeper than the straight line ramp. So, this is uh, uh, the property of uh, this type of a curve. Now, the various notations which have been used, we have all those, uh, already talked about some of the notations before. Say, we talked about phi, which was the angle between the uh, straight line of the track or the tangential line to the tangent uh, or the, to the transition curve. So, we said that this is the way it is happening. So, this becomes tangent. So, whatever angle is here, this is phi. Then L was small l that was the distance along this uh, transition curve from the point of takeoff. So, this keeps changing. So, different values can be there. R is the radius of the circular curve. Capital L is the length of the transition curve which we have already calculated say. And x and y these two things because we are talking here in the case of uh, cubic parabola as y is equals to x cube divided by 6 rl. So, this x and y they are horizontal coordinate and vertical coordinates on the transition curve. So, that means they are going to help you out in the setting of the transition curve. As you move ahead by a distance x there will be a vertical coordinate y which will be provided and which will give you a point on the transition curve. Now, this is the overall combination of the circular curve, transition curve and the straight. Say the straight section is here. From this point to this point, say if I uh, give the name as A and B. So, this A B is transition. Similarly, if we consider here as A dash and this point as B dash, then this is A dash B dash is also a transition curve. And B B dash, this is the circular curve. And beyond A, and beyond A dash, it is a straight section. So, if this straight section is being extended, then what we get here is a tangent. So, this is also a tangent and that one is will tangent. And there is a deflection angle of delta between the two tangents. Now, when we talk about this transition curve and uh, this is a tangent which is coming out. So, at this point the angle which will be there that is say phi. Similarly, on this side it will be phi. So, we have the two values here. So, this will be a phi value. This is also going to be the phi value and in between whatever total angle is there that will be basically delta minus 2 phi. Okay, so, you can read it in this form with the new notations. Now, when we talk about this uh, transition curve, this is starting from the point A, it is going ahead. Now, what happens is that at half of the length of the transition curve, there is a shift between the circular curve which if extended like this. So, if we extend the circular curve here, it will come to this point whereas the tangent is at this point and the transition curve is passing in between these two and here the two distances which are there actually if we name them if this is c l and this is m so this l m is the shift which is happening from the tangent point so, this value which we have this is a shift values which will be having so there are two s will be there. So, this is a shift s which we have talked as L square divided by 24 r. So, this is the overall layout which will be there. So, shift is the amount by which a circular curve shifts inwards to meet the transition curve. So, we have seen the circular curve is there and it, it is taken. So, this is the distance by which it has shifted. So, this is a shift s given by L square by 24 r and L is the length of the transition curve and R is the radius of the circular curve. Now, offset from the straight line which we have to calculate can be calculated using this formula y is equal to 16.7 into x cube divided by R. So, you move x distance and take a offset uh, of uh, y and that will give you the transition curve. 
Now, how the length of the transition curve can be calculated? So, there are three different ways in which it can be done. The first one is the rate of change of Kant. Now, this rate of change of Kant on the basis of this, there are desirable and the minimum values which are discussed. When we talk about desirable, we have talked about 35 mm per second. When we talked about the maximum possibility of uh, this rate, it was 55 mm per second. So, based on these two values, what formula we get is C A into V M divided by 125 or C A into V M divided by 198 and can be changed to 0 0.008 into C A into V M. Similarly, in the case of rate of change of Kant deficiency, considering those, the formula is C D that that is the change which is here instead of C A and rest of the thing remains the same. In the case of the Kant gradient, we have two values we have been discussing from the very starting one in 360 and one in 720. So, one in 720 is the value which will give you a longer length. So, it is 0.72 into C A. Whereas, if you talk about one in 360, it will give you the lesser length and that is the minimum value which has to be there. If it is not possible to provide this, then this means there is a restriction and the speeds have to be adjusted or the Kant or the Kent deficiencies has to be adjusted. Now, desirable values I already talked about 35 mm per second and minimum is 55 mm second for high speed tracks. Future speeds expected to be implemented shall be considered. So, in the case of group A it is 160, in the case of group B it is 130 kilometers per hour. If no space is available for providing the full length of the transition curve which may happen say uh, in the case of a high speed routes, if this is happening, then the length may be reduced to two third of the desirable length. So, if we are calculated the length of the transition curve, so two third of that can be considered based on the Kent and the Kent deficiency. So, the changes will be here. It may be reduced to half of the length based on the Kent gradient, but not going below the values of 1 in 360. Okay, now the length shall not be less than that. Final value is the greater of the conditions which we have discussed previously. In case the length is to be restricted, both Kant and Kant efficiency are lowered, thus reducing the maximum speed on the circular curve, but increasing the speed on the transition curve. So, this lowering of the Kant and Kant efficiency has two effects. In one case, say on the circular curve, it is reducing the maximum speed. But on the transition curve, it is improving the speed. So, it means a more uniformity in the movement of the train will be there. And the length of the transition curve is rounded off to the next higher multiple of 10 meters. So, as we talked in the case of Kent, uh, uh, we used 5 as a multiplication there. Here, this is 10 meters. So, with this, we close our discussion here uh, on the transition curve. We will we continue with it. What we have talked about is the negative Kent. And then we talked about the purposes, requirements of the provision of transition curves. Then we talked about the various types of transition curves. And finally, we have seen the three ways in which the length of the transition curve can be calculated. Thank you and we will be meeting in the next lecture.